Well, if the last couple of years weren't weird enough, apparently we decided to skip spring <laughs> and just go straight to summer. Well, good morning, ladies. Welcome to our next session in our study of Proverbs. And this time we're looking at the second part of Lesson 6, which deals with Proverbs 13 to 17. And as I study these chapters, I noticed a recurring theme, the power of our words. In fact, if my count is accurate, there were 29 verses dedicated to the topic of our speech in just these five chapters, although Proverbs has many other verses throughout on the topic. Clearly, one of the most important areas of life in which we need to exercise God's wisdom is in our speech. Our words can build someone up or tear him down. Words can incite a riot or talk a desperate person out of doing something terrible. Our words can move people to tears of grief or joy or compassion. Our words can communicate the amazing truth of the gospel and the love of Jesus. Our words can live on long after we've spoken them. Consider this enduring example of powerful speech, which I'm guessing will be familiar to you. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. These words, known as the Gettysburg Address, were spoken by President Abraham Lincoln on November 19, 1863, on the Civil War battlefield near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Isn't it interesting that he said, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here? Because we do remember. This has become one of the most notable moving speeches given by an American president in our history. 
How many people have used the phrase, the last full measure of devotion, to describe someone making the ultimate sacrifice for the greater good of humanity? The power of these words live on, as happens with so much of what we say, and yet we don't always give as much thought as we should to our words. In preparing for this lesson, I watched a sermon taught by our pastor, Charles Vermeulen, back in 2020, entitled, Bite Your Tongue. And in it, he mentions the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And the fact that this is simply not true I mean, maybe you heard this as a kid growing up and were encouraged to say this to those who were insulting or bullying you as a way of kind of deflecting their verbal assault, but it just doesn't work. Hurtful words can be as painful as sticks and stones, and maybe more so because they tend to stay with us for a long, long time. Our words have tremendous impact on others, and for followers of Christ, our words are meant to give evidence of our transformed life in him. But do they always? I think perhaps one of the most insightful and convicting passages in the Bible about our speech is found in the book of James, chapter 3 verses 1 through 12, and I'd like to turn there now. If you turn in your Bibles to James 3, James 3, and we're going to begin with verse 1, where we read, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now, we see here that James starts out talking to teachers because, of course, their whole job revolves around speaking and because of the influence they have on others and the responsibility to speak the truth, they are going to incur stricter judgment, for which reason I tremble before you now. (laughs) But James goes on to use language that really begins to include all of us in this indictment. By the time we get to verse 8, he says that no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, 
full of deadly poison. James also tells us that any person who is able to control his tongue will be able to exercise self-control over his whole body. And he uses the analogies of a bit in a horse's mouth or the rudder of a ship to show that controlling just that one small element allows the larger body, whether horse or ship or person, to be directed where it should go. That tells us just how influential and important our tongue is and just how difficult it is to get it under control. A mark of maturity in our walk with Christ is being someone who is able to control his or her tongue. And what destruction can result from our words? James compares it to a whole forest being set ablaze by one small fire. On September 5th, 2020, a fire that came to be known as the El Dorado Fire started from a small pyrotechnic device used for a baby gender reveal party at a park in Yucaipa at the base of the San Bernardino Mountains. And stoked by dry brush and high winds, the fire quickly spread to the surrounding community. By the time the fire was finally put out on November 16th, it had burned 22,680 acres, scorching nearly 36 square miles of land in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. It killed one firefighter, an 18-year veteran, and injured 13 other people, destroyed five homes and other buildings, and forced the evacuation of hundreds of residents in the area. Last summer, the couple responsible for starting the fire were charged with involuntary manslaughter and other felony and misdemeanor counts related to that fire. And this is the picture James uses to communicate the destructive potential of our speech. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And in fact, he tells us our tongues have become tools used for unrighteousness, set ablaze by the very fires of hell itself. We see this in Psalm 52, verses 1 through 4, which talk about the words of the unrighteous when it says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction. Like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. And Romans 3, 13 to 18 tells us that with the unrighteous, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's very clear here that a key component of demonstrating whether we are righteous or unrighteous is seen in the way we speak. This is not just a superficial issue, it's a heart issue. And there can be a disturbing contradiction between our behavior and the values we claim to possess in this new life that we're living as believers in Christ. James 1.26 tells us that if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. 
Jesus dealt with this very same issue in his confrontation with the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. They were meant to set a godly example of good deeds in keeping with God's commands, but instead their deeds and their words were evil. Jesus uses the analogy of a tree bearing fruit to describe the outward evidence of what's going on inside of our hearts. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 36, he rebukes the Pharisees saying, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Let's think about what Jesus says here about the connection between our words and our hearts. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our speech reflects what's really going on inside of our hearts. And if we look back at our passage in James 3, it says, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Like the tree bearing fruit analogy in Matthew, James uses the analogies of fruit bearing trees and of a water spring to point out the inconsistency between speaking words of praise to God one minute and words that curse our brothers and sisters the next. He's saying, this is not right. And once again, the analogies show that it is our inner nature, the type of person we truly are, that will become evident in our speech. Proverbs 18.21 tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And James 3 has highlighted for us the fact that we struggle to say things that bring life, which ultimately indicates a heart issue. We struggle for mastery over our tongues and sinful patterns of speech show up in several ways mentioned throughout the book of Proverbs and elsewhere in scripture. One example would be someone who goes around gossiping or slandering or speaking evil of others. All these types of destructive speech tear others down. They damage the reputation of certain people in the eyes of others. They betray the trust of people who shared aspects of their personal lives and they destroy relationships. Proverbs 11.13 tells us that whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. And Proverbs 16.28 says that a whisperer separates close friends. And we must take care that this doesn't happen in the church under the guise of sharing prayer requests. Gossip or slander repackaged as a prayer request is still just gossip or slander and it's harmful and wrong to do it. If someone has entrusted me 
with a prayer request, I need to keep it confidential unless he or she has asked me to share it with others. And even then, I only share what I've been authorized to share. Several New Testament passages associate this kind of behavior with those who are unbelievers, still dead in their sins and in rebellion against God. Romans 1, 29 to 31 describes this group as those who are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It is deeply convicting to read that the sins of gossip and slander have equal billing in this list, along with murder and haters of God. When we engage in gossip and slander, we are acting like those who are separated from God and living in darkness. We can see why James said this kind of behavior is just not right for those who belong to Christ. Another example of sinful speech is lying. And I know this comes as no surprise to any of us because we all know lying is wrong. But isn't it funny how our culture has come up with a color coding system for different types of lies based on how acceptable they are? When we think a lie is no big deal and likely to have very little impact, we call it a white lie. Actually, an article I found online proposes that there are four colors of lies. There are white lies, as I mentioned earlier, which we tell to help others. And then gray lies, which we tell partly to help others and partly to help ourselves. Black lies are told purely for selfish gain. And red lies are told out of spite or revenge. I guess the idea here is to try to analyze the motive behind someone's lie, but it's also communicating the belief that some lies are okay and just a normal part of life. The world tells us there are good lies and bad lies, but the perspective on this is subjective and unbiblical. Really what we're trying to do here is excuse ourselves from being called out for lying. We've made our peace with the fact that everyone lies, but it's only really the bad lies we have to try to avoid unless absolutely necessary. But Proverbs 13.5 says, the righteous hates falsehood, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. And Colossians 3, 9 to 10 says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Lying is a practice associated with our old life, the life we lived before we knew Christ, the life that had us under the influence of the devil, about whom Jesus says when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Telling lies links us to the behavior, even to the very character of our enemy, the devil. Next, we come to the problem that cost the Israelites their first opportunity to enter the promised land, which we read about in Numbers 14, 27 to 28, where God says to Moses and Aaron, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and of all your number, 
listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. The people of Israel had been grumbling or complaining against their leaders and against God. And as we read in the Old Testament about their journey, we see this was kind of a default attitude for them. Why? Well, sometimes it was because of their supposed misfortunes, and other times it was out of fear. But God attributes it to disobedience, ingratitude, and faithlessness. They didn't trust God or obey him. They were not thankful for what he had done for them, even after all that he did to protect, to provide, to care for them during their exodus from Egypt. It was appalling. And 1 Corinthians 10.6 tells us that we are meant to learn from their example so that we might not desire evil as they did. Their grumbling displeased God and incurred his judgment. Is this a default attitude for us? And do we, sometimes out of our ingratitude or a lack of faith, tend to grumble or complain about the people and circumstances of our lives? Now, If you're like me about this point, you're growing pretty weary of this exhortation. But wait, there's more. What about bitter, harsh, and angry speech? The kind of speech that Proverbs 12, 18 refers to when it says, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Psalm 64.3 talks about the wicked who wet or sharpen their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows. But Ephesians 4.31 tells us to let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from us, along with all malice, which is an intention to cause harm to others. Finally, we come to what the Bible calls crude, obscene, or filthy language, those words that are foolish, shameful, sexually immoral, inappropriate. Ephesians 5.4 says that we are to let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, meaning this kind of speech is not becoming. It's not suitable. It's not proper. It's not in keeping with the things we say we value, with a life that is being conformed to the image of Christ. Well, by now we're all probably feeling the weight of both the indictment in James 3 and this list of indicators I just mentioned of the ways we all sin with our speech. But... I think that it's important that we wrestle with this tension a little bit. The tension of realizing that our words sometimes, sometimes make us look more like the old person we were. The unredeemed, unrepentant, lost sinner that we were instead of the new creatures in Christ that we are now. There can be an inconsistency here between our profession of faith and our actions. And the whole epistle of James, not just chapter 3, but the whole book, is calling believers to give evidence of their faith by their good works. We're not saved by good works, but we should have good works as evidence of our faith in Christ. James 2.26 tells us faith apart from works is dead. Maybe we need to let this uncomfortable and convicting truth strengthen our resolve to cooperate with what God is doing in us by the power of his spirit to let our words reflect his character 
and his values. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we've got to do is go back to the beginning. Remember when we first started this study in the book of Proverbs, we came to understand that none of this is possible, this living a life of wisdom according to God's standards, unless we know him and we fear him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it says in Proverbs 9.10. And then we need to be willing to examine our hearts. Better still, we need to ask God to examine our hearts to determine what kinds of attitudes or desires or values we may hold that are not in keeping with his word and his character. Psalm 139, 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let this become our heart's cry and our heart's desire because the things we say are going to spring from what our hearts hold dear. And the book of Proverbs, along with the rest of the Bible, is filled with instruction for us on how to speak with wisdom. One key, which we see repeated in several passages, is the idea that we need to speak fewer words and let the words we do speak be those that we have pondered and carefully chosen so that they do good instead of harm. And by speaking less, I don't mean giving someone the silent treatment as a form of relational alienation. It means there are times when it is good to remain quiet, to listen, to pray, to think carefully about what and when and how and why we speak so that our words bring life, so that we share knowledge, truth, and encouragement. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. And Proverbs 16, 24 says, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. But if we think back to our James 3 passage, we might feel a little daunted by the thought that this seems like an impossible task for us to get the upper hand in controlling our speech and we might be discouraged by this struggle. I mean, how are we ever going to gain mastery over our wayward tongues? But we have a God who does the impossible and an infallible, all-powerful guide, the Holy Spirit, who enables us from the inside to correct our speech. It's a matter of the heart, and no external influences can ultimately change our heart. Only the transforming work of God can do that. And it's all possible because of this new life we have in Christ and the Holy Spirit who is at work in us. So in our resolve to be wise in our speech, there's the work of God within us to empower us to accomplish it. And when we're tempted to sin, he provides a way of escape. And if we stumble, he restores us by his forgiveness and his grace in our time of need. So may we then with confidence pray along with King David in Psalm 19:14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, 
O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, this has been uh, such a convicting passage to look at. And um, Lord, maybe some of us even have heavy hearts now just evaluating um, the way our speech has or has not reflected our, our love for you and our walk with you. And so, Lord, we come to you with repentant hearts. We come to you with a new resolve to let our speech reflect godliness, to reflect your character. And so we pray that you would just allow the scriptures we have been studying, Lord, in Proverbs and elsewhere in your word, Lord, to just bear fruit in us. Lord, may, may we see the work of the Holy Spirit in enabling us to be people who speak words of life, who speak with wisdom, who speak with knowledge and truth and encouragement to one another. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. You're dismissed to your groups. And um, we have one note. Connie Elliott's group is going to be led by Terry Eggers. Thank you, ladies.